Hello again. As we said a few minutes ago, now Raquel Said, Director of Analysis and Strategy at Acevio, is going to welcome you. Muy bien. I w good morning now I w uh, and welcome to Bio Spain. It's a great honor for Acevallo to inaugurate this session as coordinators of the European Climate Pact in Spain. I would like to thank all of you for being part of this event, especially to the European Commission who is here today with us. Four months ago, we kicked off a movement across the European Union to encourage us to build a more sustainable Europe. The Climate Pact is part of the European Green Deal and is helping the EU to meet its goals to be the first climate neutral continent in the world by, two, by 2050. This is a unique opportunity for, for people, communities and organizations to participate in the fight against climate change across Europe. Now we are forced to seek and promote a new sustainable economic model, applying new, new, new ways of producing and consuming. And here, the biotech sector has the potential to offer significant benefits to society. For instance, bio-based products can be reused, recycled, converted into energy and can be composed thanks to biotechnological processes. We contribute to circular, to circular bioeconomy by giving a second life to urban forests and agri-food wastes. However, to be successful, people, communities and organizations must get involved and take action. This is why Acevallo will keep working to promote initiatives that support a green economic model and that aim to strengthen the links with society. For this reason, we are here today to know more about the pact, but also to discuss about how different stakeholders from business, scientific, educational and financial fields work to increase sustainable solutions. Now, I would like to give the floor to Katerina Fortun, Policy Officer at the European Commission, who will tell us more about the, about the pact. Thank you for being uh, here with us today and I wish you a fruitful and, en and en enriching session. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Because we had a big problem with the audio. So thank you, Raquel, for, uh, for the introduction to your climate pact. And I'm really happy to be here, even though I'm in Brussels. Uh, but really happy to see that real action is ha happening in and so I'm really happy to be part of the European Climate Pact. Sorry, we have we have some yeah. some connection so problem. It's seen. Okay. Katerina, can you can you can you Is try again? Now? Can you try again? Okay. Uh, try again. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not working. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's happened with the connection. Um, can you try mm -hmm. again to, to see if, if we can hear you properly? It's a, it's a real pity. Okay, either I can start, I can connect again. Or do you hear me now? Okay. Hmm. Uh, are you, uh, there is a problem with the, with, no se oye, with the connection, you know, from Brussels. Con la conexión de Bruselas hay un problema, no sé si podéis hacer algo. Sí, 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 le voy a decir a los compañeros. Vale, no estoy escuchando. 
Disculpad, we are, we are sorry, you know, with these uh, technical issues. Okay. Katerina? See, let, let's, let's, let's try again. I think there is a little bit of delay, you know, <laughs> between you again. and us, but uh, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's try. <laughs> okay, maybe it's Brussels and Pamplona. So, I'll maybe talk slowly. Yeah, it's also funny that I, uh, I hear the echo. Okay, I'm really happy to be here because it's a great opportunity to talk to bio enterprises and these enterprises also create good quality jobs. And uh, I believe that in Spain is more than 100,000 quality good jobs. So I'm really happy to share how you can be part of also of the European Climate Pact. Uh, let's see if I can, uh, if you can see my presentation. So it's more visual. So indeed, as Raquel mentioned, uh, we launched the European Climate Pact, which means um, it's really involving everyone to be part of the European Green Deal. And I really like the slide because it talks about where we are now with COVID. And we have a chance to go to normal which there is a bit of nostalgia and yet um, what is it to, to go to normal? Indeed, when I, what I see is lots of pollution, noise, going to office just to move from house to other places, so lots of traffic. Also, um, in terms of inclusiveness, not very good quality jobs and the normal at this moment is that eight richest people actually have the same wealth as four billion people of the planet at the lowest level so now we are in COVID and we have time to reflect how do we want to live and how do we want to grow? What does it mean to live a good life? So a way forward is really the image with green, blue infrastructure, with businesses that do follow climate sustainable practices that take care of their employees. They are aware of us, of people, and the planet, the nature. Now, we also ask the Europeans, what do they think? So 96% of Europeans have already taken one, at least one action to tackle climate change. And 93% of Europeans believe that climate change is a serious problem. And 90% of Europeans agree that greenhouse gas emissions should be reduced to make us really a climate neutral continent by 2050. 
So we do have people on board. Now, uh, a very interesting thing is uh, to really take the action at personal level uh, and ask what is my footprint on our planet. I invite you to have a look at the consumer footprint calculator that was developed by colleagues in JRC, in a, a research center of the European Commission, and to really uh, see what are our habits. And the European Climate Pact invites everyone, the citizens, us uh, as people, to take actions, to take a concrete step, either to fly less, uh, cut food waste, um, eat seasonal food, really start living more in local economy and support local businesses, local enterprises. Now, at the European Commission, there is an action plan, a vision, which is called the European Green Deal. I imagine that you have heard about the European Green Deal. Now, in concrete, it is about legislation, policies, we also adopted European climate law, where actually the reduction of emissions will be binding for all member states. So by 2030, there is a mid-term target that there has to be decrease of EU's emissions by 55%. And yet, to, the, to Europe, it is clear that it's important to have the action plan. It is important to have policies and laws. And yet the most important thing is to have people, everyone on board. <clears throat> and this is why the European Climate Pact was launched, to really invite everyone on board as a citizen, as an employee, as a business person, as a politician, and the Climate Pact is about empowering people because we really need to, um, to pass message to wine lovers and also to football fans. So today I brought two examples. One is about wine, which I know that uh, also you have very good wine in Navarra. This example is from Bordeaux and one of the wineries, they prepared wine, how the wine would taste in 2015 if we don't take action. And people tried the wine and they really did not like it. So it was about raising awareness that we all have to take action so we can preserve what we love. I also bring this video of uh, UEFA. I will not have time to play it now. And if you have the chance, uh, I find it really interesting. Indeed, my husband, he is from Pamplona and sometimes I do struggle to include him in climate actions and everyday steps. So this video from uh, UEFA on football really helped uh, to also convince him on the importance to really take concrete steps and change our life. Now, what is the climate pact? So what is it about? It is about raising awareness, empowering people with the information that we can all take action. And it's really about bringing people from all corners of Europe, bring them together so we support each other and we can act together. Now for the businesses, okay, you can be part of the pact as a climate pact ambassador. So anyone is welcome. You can represent your business. You can be on your own. Uh, you can come from a public private organization, from public administration. You can be a politician. You can be a student. You can be a retired uh, person. Anyone is welcome. And if you would like to take action in your local community, maybe just to talk about climate or invite people uh, to cook maybe with local products. You can become Climate Pact Ambassador. You will be supported by the Commission and it gives voice to your community. It gives voice to Pamplona. It gives voice to any town in Navarra, any community, any village. It gives voice also to Spain. At the moment, we have 1000 Climate Pact Ambassadors. 
We also very much welcome young people, so you can become an ambassador if you are 15 years old. So please do join. And this is the way to be part of the pact and directly be connected with the European Commission and with other people. Also, as an enterprise, you can commit to a pledge, which means, for instance, uh, biotech. Of course, in the field that you do, to be sustainable, you can also make a pledge that you raise awareness of your employees, that you just talk to your employees. As simple as bringing local products to your canteen or offering electric cars to your management or electric bikes, even better, to your employees. So it is really about what you do as an enterprise and also what you do within the enterprise. You can also organize any dialogue, um, any gathering, any event. So we would be happy to join you as what's happening now in BioSpain. You can also do it at smaller level in your company and we would be happy to support you. And I think that with this, I, I stop because uh, I definitely passed my 10 minutes. I hope that it served the purpose. And if you have any question, I would be really happy to, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. So thank you, Katerina. Thank you also to Raquel. And now we have a connection with uh, Manuel Parga. He's the Director of Marketing and Head of Sustainability on the Spanish Olympic Committee and Ambassador of the Climate Pact. He's from Spain, but he's going to speak in English. So welcome, Manuel. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. For me, it's a pleasure being here, and thank you to Be Spain for inviting the Spanish Olympic Committee to present to others what we are doing. Um, I don't know if you see me properly because I'm seeing the screen and I'm not talking in the screen, but I, I can, I think I can, you can hear me. Hello, can you confirm that everything is okay? Hello? Well, so let's go. Um, first of all, I would like to talk about the sustainability strategy of the Spanish Olympic Committee. And before talking, we are members where we are uh, ambassadors. I'm representing the Spanish Olympic Committee and we, we got this um, uh, that you can see this um, membership as an ambassador. And, uh, well, first of all, I would like to talk a bit about what we are. I mean, who we are. Now, the Spanish Olympic Committee, we are a private entity. We are not government. Many people think that we are public administration, but we are not. We um, uh, were founded in 1912. We have more than 100 years. Uh, operating in Spain. We belong to a private organization, the International Olympic Committee, and we are with other 206 National Olympic Committees. Our mission and vision is to promote the practice of sport and the Olympic values in the territory of Spain. We manage the team of Spain in the Olympic Games, the Winter and Summer Games, and one of the editions of the European Games. And we, our members, are the 59 uh, sport federations. 30, uh, 35 out of those are Olympic and 24 non-Olympic. We manage the team of Spain, which are uh, accumulated 12,000 athletes. And we have obtained uh, recently in Tokyo 17 medals, but accumulated 48 gold medals, silver medals 73, and bronze medals 50. But uh, the question here is 
uh, we are promoting the sport values and the practice of sport, but we have another question in our mind, which is what we can do for our planet. Climate change is affecting the sport heavily. Just think about the winter sports, or just think about a runner running in a very polluted city. So we need to do something to create a better world and a healthy planet. But at the same time, um, the sports events are generating emissions. So it's our responsibility to be part of this movement to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's why we have defined in the Spanish Olympic Committee this uh, sustainability strategy. Our sustainability strategy is aligned with the 17 sustainable development goals that you probably all know. We are not just focusing on uh, environmental issues, but also social issues. But let's see about uh, the, what we are doing specifically because we started this strategy in 2017. We start talking about the Sustainable Development Goals a long time ago, almost four, four years and a half already. So we have eight lines of actions. We have defined a roadmap very clear, and we have started four years ago. We have eight lines of action, health and well-being, energy efficiency, mobility, circular economy, digital transformation, gender equality, social action, and education. All of those lines are uh, explained here. We, of course, are talking about the sport, so we promote the practice of the sport, but we need to achieve energy efficiency in all of our quarters and uh, sport um, infrastructure and venues. Uh, we need to uh, obtain a reduction of gas emissions in all our operations and basically in mobility, which is the highest footprint that we generate. Imagine 80,000 people going to a football match. They generate a lot of car, um, gas emissions in just the transportation. And circular economy, the three R's, reduce, recycle, and reuse in all our consumption. We consume a lot of textile. Digital transformation, we are convinced that we can do more with less resources, and this is digital, uh, to press everything into digital, because we will generate less weight at the same time. Gender equality is one of our must, it's one of the Olympic values, equality. So we can promote the participation of women in the sport organization. Social action, we, uh, the, the, the climate change have produced a lot of poverty worldwide. So we, the sports and the athletes, uh, we, have, uh, we are a great voice to pass this message to the, to the world and uh, you know, try to compensate all those damages and education. Education is key, not just for the Olympic values, but um, as I said, the Olympic movement and the athletes are a great voice to pass messages to society and focusing specifically in younger generations. We have defined three spheres of action in each of these lines. So first of all, we have to be ourselves sustainable in all our operation. We started in 2017 we, and we have uh, reduced to zero the use of, plas of plastic. We consume 100% of our energy coming from renewable energy. We have reduced 100% our, our gas, uh, gas emissions in this kind thing. So we have done many things because before going to others to show what we can we can do or we want to do, we have to do ourselves and we have to, do a, to be an example. The second sphere of um, activity is to go to the Olympic movement. The Olympic movement is all the national federations from the very fancy ones like soccer or basketball to the very small ones. And we go first to the national. We have 59 uh, national federations and then the regional federations. Just have in mind that 
60% uh, of the Spanish population are related to, ex to sport or practice sport. And this is almost 30 million people. And this can be a scale to other countries. So sport federation are key. And the last one, but the most important one, is we have to be sustainable in the sporting events. Uh, sporting events are um, the activity that generate the highest carbon footprint in, in the practice of a sport. Uh, but it's a great way to pass messages, not only to the public administration that is holding this event or the city that is uh, hosting that event, but also to all athletes, all organizations around the sporting events, all, all the suppliers, all the organizing committees, all the owners of the um, venues that participate in that event, but uh, spectators, all the fans, all the followers of that event, just not being, may, maybe being at the same uh, venue, but also following the event through uh, the channels, social media, or the TV. So sporting events are key for us and are the most, uh, uh, are the events that generate the most uh, carbon footprint. Uh, but another key point for us is together we can make it better. That's why we participate in the European Climate Pact, because we think that together we can achieve things much better and sooner. This is a principle of the Olympic movement, teamwork. So we, as you, you see the Olympic Greens, we are members of the Olympic um, Sustainability proper, uh, Projects. We are members since 2018 of the Global Punk Compact of the United Nations. We have an agreement with the Federation of the Cities and Provinces of Spain. We achieve more than 9,000 cities in Spain uh, through this agreement. We are also, uh, we have a partner of UNITA, the agency of the United Nations that is uh, focusing of, uh, about the um, um, education and sustainable development goals. And we have developed a few programs, educational programs with them. Of course, European Climate Pact is key. We are members, Spain is member of the European Union and the Spanish Olympic Committee is really, really committed with the climate change. And we want to be the voice um, for the Spanish society. And for us, it's very important to be part of this um, organization and to be ambassadors. We have a very important agreement with the central government of Spain through the Ministry of Ecological Transition, not just uh, in terms of um, digital transformation or uh, uh, energy efficiency, but also in educational programs, because uh, I think education is the first step to be more sustainable in the future. And we are members, the first National Olympic Committee being members of the United Nations Climate Change, the uh, Sports for Climate Action. Uh, since that date, we participate with other big organizations like UEFA or Roland Garros or other National Olympic Committee or Paris 2024 in order, all our uh, organization around the sports in order to identify the roadmap and to help each other. And as I said before, that together we can do it better. So in order to achieve that vision of the uh, Spanish Olympic Committee and the Olympic movement, our vision is to build a better world through sport, but we want to do it together with other partners and we need a better and more sustainable world to live in. Thank you very much. And I encourage everyone that, that, that can do anything, any step, any small piece of action to participate and to be part of this European climate change. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Manuel, for your words and for being with us this morning in Pamplona. 
Now we have a new panel. Maria Segura Fornieles, Deputy Director, General and Technical Director in Alga Energy, is going to moderate it and it's going to discuss how to get involved in the, Europe, involved in the European Pact on Climate Change. This uh, panel relates on the collaboration of the Spanish Biotech Platform and the Ministry of Science and Innovation. Thanks for your support. Maria, Thank you. Uh, to talk about this subject, we will come, we will come the experts Enrique Espiguzman from uh, Repsol Technology Lab, Lorena Tudela Marco, Agri-Food Study Service of the Cajamar Cooperative Group, Javier Gil, Director Biomass Department in CENER, and Celsa Monroz Barahona, Director General of Climate Change of the Valencian Autonomous Government. Thank you, all of you be with us. Uh, muchísimas gracias. They are going to speak in English, but they are from Spain. So, gracias por acompañarnos esta mañana en Baluarte, en la inauguración de Bio Spain 2000, 2000, 2021. Thank you. Um, sí, ¿no? eh, Celsa. Una para allá. Siéntate ahí, Lorena. Okay, um, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this roundtable related with the uh, European Climate Pact. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce again our speakers, and of course, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, Enrique Espi is the Technical Advisor in Repsol uh, Technology Lab. Lorena Tudela is Agri-Food Market Analyst at Plataforma Tierra, uh, uh, Grupo Cooperativo Cajamar. And Javier Gil is director of Biomass Department in CENER. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, according to what the previous speakers have told us, the PACT is an open and inclusive uh, initiative that invites people, communities, and organizations to connect and share knowledge, learn about climate change, develop, implement, and scale up solutions. The climate crisis is real and affects all of us, but everyone can contribute to find solutions and implement them. So the first question for all of you is, could you tell us uh, how you and your organizations can contribute to solving this crisis? Lorena? Thank you. Um, you can hear me well? It's fine? Okay. So good morning, all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. And well, I would like to start briefly describing um, who we are in order to better understand why Cajamar uh, Credit Bank is uh, being here, right? So um, in addition of um, support or financial services, um, Cajamar, it's, uh, it's been always working um, in, the, in order to transfer and generate um, knowledge always link it in agri-food sector. That's why um, in the 70s, we create a research center that I know that you already know in Almería, and later on another one in Valencia in the 19s. And in both centers, uh, our main goal is to um, better understand how agri-food sector uh, works and needs, no? And well, we don't do that alone, of course. We always are working and trying to collaborate uh, with other partners. Um, well, this, this I, I would like to start just saying that because this link with the agri-food sector is really important to understand um, that we really um, know how, I mean, what are the main challenges that agri-food sector has to face against you know, this crisis. So coming back to your question, in order to really um, uh, try to contribute to solve this crisis, Cajamar has um, two main lines, let's say, no? in, in order to be concrete. In the first line, we really high, I mean, highly work in the, in the area of supporting technologies that all, all of them improve um, sustainability, right? Then, let's say more in detail, we are working in trying to improve technologies that try to achieve um, how to use soil, how to 
um, safe water. In, in other words, uh, we, are trying to, we try to bring these technologies to the market. And in other hand, our second main goal is try to fill the gap between these technologies and the final users. This is, I mean, this is uh, what we are doing like daily. Okay, thank you, Lorena. Javier? Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, in your case, we are a technological center working on renewables and including also bio-based product uh, development. And our mission is to develop technology and transfer technology and promote the acquisition and uh, the dissemination of knowledge and, and technological know-how. This is the way we have to work to, to, com to put our uh, yeah. work in order to, to solve this uh, climate crisis. Okay. Thank you, Javier. Enrique? Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Asabio, for the invitation. And thank you, Maria, for the introduction and for the, for the question. First, I, I, I would like to say that, uh, well, uh, climate impact is an important tool because, uh, yeah, uh, Europe is leading the fight uh, against uh, climate change uh, through the Kyoto Protocol or the Green Deal. But uh, the fight against uh, climate change is not a matter only of le legislation and it's not a matter only of uh, authorities, but all the society should be involved. So I think that uh, climate pact is a excellent platform to share information, knowledge, uh, uh, success experience to, to contribute to, to, to this fight. So in this sense, uh, Repsol, that is a multi-energy company, uh, would like to, to share some of uh, the experience in, in, this, in this field. Perhaps the story could, could start in, in 2010 when, when you started to to apply the energy efficiency concept. And this is a, a very good option. And I think the first, the first option to, to choose because uh, it, we, we have managed to save uh, around 5 million tons of carbon dioxide since 2010 and combining uh, environmental sustainability and at the same time uh, economic profitability. That is a very, very important issue. But uh, right now, I think that energy efficiency is not enough. And this is why we are following two different pathways. The first one is to transform our uh, traditional oil, oil and gas business, transforming our refineries in what we call the, the refineries for the future, uh, changing our uh, fossil uh, raw materials to uh, a low carbon uh, feedstock, uh, using mainly residues or renewable carbon uh, biomass. Uh, in this sense, uh, we are using this uh, renewable carbon uh, feedstock to produce uh, both materials uh, through the uh, uh, circular economy program. Uh, we, we have uh, circular uh, polyolefins through mechanical and chemical recycling and also uh, polyols for the polyurethane sector through, through chemical uh, recycling, through solvolysis. And we have the commitment to, to, to use 20% uh, of recycled feedstock uh, in, the, in the chemical sector uh, by 2030. And the second option for this renewable uh, feedstock is to use uh, to produce advanced biofuels. Uh, I would like to mention that this is something that we, we are doing for, for years, but uh, right now we are accelerating this program. And this summer, for example, we have produced uh, uh, 5,000 tons of uh, biojet for the, uh, for the uh, uh, air transport sector in our Bilbao uh, refinery, and we have the commitment to, to accelerate uh, this program. And uh, finally, the, the last pathway we are following is uh, entering in new uh, business, in this case, the production of renewable electricity through investments in the wind and uh, in, in uh, solar plants. And in 2020, for example, uh, at 30 percent of our investment is uh, in, in this renewable uh, electricity production. So this is some of, of the experience and, uh, that Repsol would like to, to share with, with, with you in order to, to show how we contribute to the, to the climate fight, uh, okay. to the climate change fight. Okay. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, in the initial phase, the pact will prioritize uh, action focused on four areas that offer immediate benefits, not only for the climate and the environment, but also for the health and well-being of citizens. Uh, green areas, green transport, green buildings and green skills. 
The pact will expand over time to other areas such as sustainable consumption and production, the quality of soils, rural areas, oceans and coastal regions, as well as healthy foods and sustainable diets. Therefore, the question here in Spain is what areas do you think we have to focus on? Okay, um, it's, it's not easy, no, let's say that um, there are so many things to do and to select some areas, it's, it's quite hard. But um, yeah, getting yeah, directly in your uh, question, in Cajamar we focus our work in four main areas. The first one is uh, take care of soil. I mean, soil matters, right? And uh, yeah, soil is fundamental for the agri-food production. That's why in Cajamar we um, believe that if we know, I mean, if we understand how it works, then we will better uh, ensure the, a, a good land management. So, okay. So, um, in this way, for example, as an example, no, using microorganisms in the soil, uh, we increase the capture of CO2 and also um, we will get a stronger food system, which is no, it's a way of fight, fight against that crisis, right? And the second point is to keep biodiversity in farming. Um, here, another example is using multi practices and also uh, biological control to reduce the level of inputs needed. And the third one is to use or to support green energies. Uh, why? Because the food sector really needs a lot of energy. For example, I'm just um, for just give us some examples. Uh, um, just pumping water for the irrigation system to one place to another. Also, all the food process needs a lot of energy, all the food transformations, cool storage. And yeah, it's all these green energies are very welcome no, to fix the, this energy demands. And also the final one is to support bioeconomy because yeah, it's now the whole industry and also, I mean, from farm to the industry, everybody is uh, aware that we have to really reduce and achieve uh, the, the the use of less water and less carbon emissions. So uh, let's take profit of all these formulas no, to achieve our goals. So uh, we believe that at the end, with all these four areas, we get uh, as a final result um, healthy food. Uh, we can decrease uh, the use of natural resources and at the end we generate or we support the idea to create employment in the rural areas that are really needed in Spain. Okay, sorry because I have to interrupt. Uh, I didn't know that Felsa Monros, who is the general director of climate change from the Valencian regional government. Sorry, uh, Felsa, I didn't know that uh, you are connected via online. And coming back to the previous question, Felsa, if you want to add uh, anything, uh, please feel, feel free. And again, sorry for, for my mistake. Uh, I think we have some problems with the, with yeah. the audio. You can't hear me? No, no we can now. Oops. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, uh, Elsa, we can hear you. We can hear yes. you. Yes. Yes. It's okay. okay. Now it's okay. Perfect. Uh, no, I, I was saying that we were having uh, technical problems. In any case, thank you very much to Aseria and, and to Bio Spain for organizing and inviting us. As you said, uh, we are the Valencian Regional Government. And uh, among our actions, uh, we have declared the climate emergency two years ago, and since then we have been working on a new regional climate law which establishes objectives and tack uh, tackling mitigation adaptation, but also raising awareness and capacity building. To prepare this law, we had several bilateral meetings with all kinds of actors, but also six thematic meetings uh, with more than 100 stakeholders to explain the purpose of the measures and to listen 
to their concerns to design a holistic regulation. My department is also responsible for the Regional Environmental Education Center that uh, has joined the Climate Pact. We are ambassadors and uh, has stressed its activity in climate awareness, trying to build up a better awareness to be a more critical and more committed uh, society. We provide uh, training to teachers, to civil servants, to young people. And yesterday, for example, we had a meeting with the education department of the regional government to establish the climate emergency strategy in the education portfolio and in the curriculum. And uh, we also work in other areas as uh, last week we presented a new simulation to show the future climate scenarios on the coastal area. Uh, to see inundation, the floods, the, the ocean, uh, to help policy actors, citizens, investors to take decisions on socioeconomical and urban planning. These are some of the, of the measures that we are taking and the actions. And uh, well, I think that it's very related to, to all the, uh, the objectives that uh, Climate Pact uh, has uh, on it. Thank you, Felisa, for your introduction and contribution. Um, Javier, I don't know if you coming back to the, the previous the question. Previous question. In my opinion, uh, increasing forest area coverage and uh, promoting the, the use of forest products as a carbon sink is one of the most effective and cost-effective uh, ways to, to for carbon dioxide capture in the long term. At the same time, we have to because we already have to, to act now, we have to take measures also in the short and medium term and, and in my opinion also is transport is one of the main issues due to the, the, the percentage of carbon dioxide emissions that uh, are uh, dependent on, the, on, the, on all the transport modes. We have to tackle all transport modes from passenger cars that could be done by electrification but also have to think also in heavy transport, maritime transport and aviation. We have other kind of solutions with low carbon fuels, including, including biofuels also in this, uh, mix, uh, in this uh, energy mix. Okay, thank you, Javier. Enrique? Uh, yes, well, uh, of course, all, all the areas uh, you have mentioned are important, but uh, I agree with Javier that uh, perhaps the transport is uh, one of them to, to remark because uh, Repsol is very focused in, in, in supplying the energy for the transport sector. So I, I would like to mention uh, three, three projects we, we have related to the production of uh, energy for the, for the transport uh, sector. Uh, the first one is... Uh, a plant we will we are uh, building in in a Cartagena refinery that is uh, focused in producing advanced biofuels through uh, hydro processing uh, uh, renewable feedstock, especially residues, to produce uh, uh, hydro biodiesel, uh, biojet, uh, bio nafta, and biopropane for the for the transport uh, for, to be used in, in cars, in, in planes, and in trucks. Uh, the capacity is around uh, 250 kilotons uh, per year, and the, this plant will save around 900,000 uh, tons of uh, carbon dioxide. The second project I would like to mention it uh, will be located in, in, in the Bilbao refinery, and in this case the technology is quite different. The feedstock will be carbon dioxide directly and uh, renewable hydrogen to produce what we call uh, synthetic fuels or uh, e-fuels. And in this project, we, are, uh, we, we have created a joint venture with uh, Saudi Aranco and the EVE, that is the uh, Ente Vasco de la Energía. And uh, this will be operational in 2023. And the final uh, uh, project I would like to mention is uh, also located in, in Bilbao. And it's a project to gasify uh, urban waste in order to, to to use this, uh, this gas as energy source in our refinery, uh, substituting uh, fossil, fossil gases uh, fuels. And in this uh, way, we could uh, reduce the carbon footprints of every product that comes from the, from the refinery. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Enrique. I don't know if Celsa wants to uh, add something more or 
is okay from your side in this question? Yeah, well, uh, just to, to say that we are also working uh, with municipalities. We are very close uh, to citizens and it's uh, governmental. Uh, we want that uh, working with them because they are closer to the citizens and it's uh, governance levels can make uh, that they, uh, they accept they are part of their responsibility. So we encourage uh, municipalities to draft an action plan and a climate action plan, and then we provide them with financial support to implement those measures, mainly in mobility and energy, uh, because we think that these are the main areas to start with. They are the most visible ones for the citizens and uh, we can see that it's easier to implement and it has a, a higher impact. Okay, thank you, Celsa, for your, for your views. Um, now I would like to ask you uh, some specific questions uh, according to the entity that you represent. Um, Enrique, for example, Repsol, as you have mentioned, is a big multi-energy company with extensive presence all over the world. So taking advantage of this, what kind of pledges do you think you can make, you can make to the Climate Pact? Well, we, we, we have a very clear and quantitative uh, pledges and commitments. Uh, the most important is that uh, we were the first energy uh, company to announce that uh, we will be a net zero emissions uh, uh, company by 2050. But uh, we have some intermediate checkpoints in order to, to reach uh, this, this uh, objective. Uh, we will reduce our carbon intensity index uh, by 14 uh, by 2025, 30% uh, by 2030 and 50% by 2040. But uh, we have also some short-term uh, commitments or, or objectives, for example, to reduce uh, our methane uh, emissions by 25% by uh, 2030 to reduce our routine uh, flaring uh, by 50% uh, by 2030 also. Uh, we have also some uh, objectives to for uh, renewable electricity production. I think that our uh, 8.3 gigawatt of production capacity by 2025 and 15 gigawatts uh, uh, by 2030. And we have also objectives uh, for the renewable hydrogen, that don't forget to mention hydrogen, uh, that uh, are uh, four, 400,000 tons uh, by 2025 and 1 1.5 uh, gigawatts by 2030. And uh, one last commitment that is not quantitative, but it's, it's very important is our commitment with the technology developments. I think that technology developments are absolutely necessary to reach uh, our objective uh, against uh, climate change. And perhaps to, to mention our projects uh, related to, to carbon capture uh, use and storage. Um, for example, we are developing uh, programs uh, to transfer carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into solid uh, car uh, carbonates uh, that can be used in the cement or the, the building sector as a carbon, carbon sink. And this is also important to mention uh, technology developments. Thank you, Enrique. Mm -hmm. um, Lorena, from a financial point of view, what kind of activities do you think are necessary to finance in order to achieve the objectives uh, of the pact? Okay, so, um, well, being, uh, being a credit bank, no, being a Cajamar, we know that we play a unique role trying, o sea, in ensuring um, that people or agribusiness can achieve their goals, no? Because we know uh, we are aware that we have a, an, yeah, we influence, no, we, we can have an effect on what, what, what projects finally the companies develop, no. So um, that's why we really want to fall involved in all these projects, no, because we really support the role of science, technology, and innovations. That's why yeah, it's so great to to hear about your old projects, and why I mean. Why we really believe that we can support is because on one hand we have the experience from decades and also because we interact with all the actors in the agri-food uh, value chains. And yeah, coming back in our two main lines of work, like 
first try to support the companies that are developing these uh, companies, I, these technologies. Let's say that our main activities is to to, to go close to clo to work close with them, no, and mainly uh, this needs time because these projects are. Um, we are talking about long-term projects, no, and also uh, most of these projects are with or have uh, some high level of risk, no, and we we know that because most of them are in the early stage of development, and because we know that. Uh, and because we really believe that it's worth it to support them, because when the results appear, I mean, they can drive really structural changes in the whole sector. So, um, for example, here, this uh, I would like to share with you all that uh, in Cajamar, like 50 years ago, we start to uh, give uh, financial support in, for the irrigation systems in Almeria. And well, everybody knows like you know, the huge change that Almeria has uh, developed. You know, and um, nowadays we are still, I mean, keeping up this uh, financial support in the uh, in the you know, in the in the area of. Uh, try to support the best use of water, no? And that's why we support so many uh, startups that are working on that line. And in the, in the other uh, line that we are working, it's uh, this, fill this gap, no? Try to, um, uh, trying to um, ensure as quickly as possible that companies have access to these technologies. Uh, we create a Plataforma Tierra. I don't know if you already know, it's a kind of marketplace where you can find all the companies, uh, all the technologies, and uh, try to apply for them, right? Um, well, if you, if you have time, I, I really encourage you to have a look on the website. I hope you like it. Okay. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, CELSA, uh, environmental education and green skills will be an important factor in achieving the PACT's objectives. What actions are necessary to promote their development? Well, uh, firstly, I think that we need to have a diagnosis of what is required, which skills we need, and the purpose of that skills. Uh, if we want to change behavior uh, about uh, mobility residues or we need professional skills in the industry or building. Uh, and then uh, also to, we need to identify which gaps we have, which skills are lacking and who are the, those target groups. And, and then finally to define this strategy to ensure the success with different channels of communication, different tools, uh, messages, uh, to motivate and to, to reach those target groups. And uh, what we are doing also is to ensure that we have multipliers, because at the end, we need that the message arrive or reach uh, the most uh, of the people. And that means that we have to train teachers, we have to train people that then they will be the, the ambassadors. Uh, and that's uh, also uh, one of the reasons why we think that it's so attractive, the, the climate pact, uh, because uh, it makes this kind of uh, oil drop that uh, goes to, to all the territory. Okay, thank you, Celsa. Um, Javier. Research and collaboration with technological transfer companies are essential to improve profitable and um, uh, sustainable ready-to-use products. What are the main barriers to bring these products to the market? In this case, I agree with uh, Lorena. Uh, we need financial support in all the life cycle of development projects uh, from low to real up to demo stage. Uh, we need in, uh, incentives in order to collaborate with the industry to, to bring uh, te technology from low TRL to the market. In this sense, we are working on uh, TRL levels from the lab in low TRL up to demo stage. But for our residual technological center, uh, when you reach the pilot stage, it's quite uh, complicated from the financial point of view. And uh, the project, uh, um, the requirements of money for the project increase uh, some order of magnitude. So we need, a, and at the same time for the industry, uh, the real is too low and the risk is still high for, for, for this kind of investment. So we need some, 
some kind of support in order to, to, to be able to collaborate to bring the technology when you reach a significant level to, to the requirement for, to bring the technology for, for the market. This is our vision. Thank you, Javier. And finally, I would like to ask each of you uh, to briefly conclude your views uh, on the importance of the Climate Pact and, and our actions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, trying to be short, no, briefly, uh, which is not easy, but let's say, like, um, I would like to say that agri-food is part of the solution. Agri-food sector is part of the solution. So, as a financial entity, mm, we highly connected with the agri-food sector. We know that we play a role here, and uh, that's why we want to have a voice in driving this, or trying to contribute to solve this crisis. Um, yeah, we really believe that we need to loudly uh, yeah, share our, our opinions or, and our experience. Thank you, Lorena. Javier? Government and, com and companies' commitment is necessary, but uh, the commitment of the citizens is a very power is a powerful uh, uh, tool. Uh, we change the consumer behavior from for energy, for products, for everything. We will uh, change uh, all the economy. This is uh, it's difficult because it's long term, but it's one of the keys also. Okay. Yes, uh, well, I think that uh, we have to stress that we are on emergency, that we have a very narrow opportunity window, and we need to be brave, sincere, and fast in this ecological transition. So we need to inform, to get aware, uh, to draft this roadmap uh, through a lot of communication, and this will be the key uh, actions to, to succeed. Thank you, Celsa. Enrique? Yeah, well, very shortly, uh, to, to remark the, the commitment of Repsol with the supply of uh, accessible, affordable and low carbon energy to the society. And perhaps to, to remark also the, how important is uh, technology development uh, in order to transform this big challenge into business opportunities. Okay. Thank you, Enrique. In closing, our everyday choices matter. Climate action is an opportunity for everyone to improve our lives, our economy, and our society. While many people and organizations are already taking steps for the climate, others are eager to learn more so they can start making climate conscious choices. The European Climate Pact intends to bring everyone together, as it happened in this session. So thank you very much to the speakers. Uh, and to the audience for joining us and I hope this session has been as enjoyable as it, and informative as it has been uh, for us. We invite you to visit the Climate Pact website and see the initiatives and actions that we can take, both as individuals and companies, so to counteract this crisis. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Escarri Casco. Qué bueno. have a hard job ahead, but it's also interesting to discover how much uh, we can all do just sometimes with little things, little change, sometimes starting at home. Now we're going to uh, talk about bioproducts and how to pay the way for a more sustainable planet. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you. Ines del Campo, senior R&D engineer at the Spanish National Renewable Energy Center, is going to moderate this panel, which relies on the collaboration of Alga Energy. Ines, Ines, she is going. Yes, she's here. Is joined by Begoña Ruiz from um, Ainia, a technology center in Bilbao. Michael Brankham. Managing Director in the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund, Germany, Pilar Llorente Ruiz de Azua, Project Officer in Bio-Based Industries Joint Undertaking, and Maria Segura Fornieles, Deputy Director General and Technical Director in Alga Energy.